Hi, I'm Noah and welcome to Architecture in Sci-Fi Film. Today I'm going to talk about a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that just celebrated 10 years. Since there are a lot of movies in the Cinematic Universe, I divided them into two major categories, Earthbound and Space Opera. And even doing so, there is a lot of ground to cover. This video is going to be part 1 of the Space Opera and I will be addressing Guardians of the Galaxy Volumes 1 and 2. And in the next video, I will address Thor, all three movies released so far. When the first Guardians of the Galaxy was released in in 2014, we were introduced to a colorful team and an even more colorful world outside Terra. Previous to this movie, the only realm in the MCU we saw, other than our own planet, was Asgard, a world on a platter the size of a city. Thor calls it the planet, who am I to disagree with the Lord of Thunder? <clears throat> God of Thunder! God of Thunder, sorry. The Marvel Cinematic Universe expanded greatly in the recent years, with the introduction of many alien races and several planets that accompany our band of heroes in their space adventures. This type of planet-hopping film is not something new, but it does come with a lot of challenges, especially to the production design team. If in most movies the art department has to develop one alien civilization, in Space Opera they design a variety of locations and creatures, each with a distinctive look, and all of them have to work in this fictional universe. So how do you make a mosaic of worlds believable? First of all, the teams behind Guardians of the Galaxy took a page from Star Wars book and rooted their designs in this world's rich history. Secondly, although the source of inspiration is existing architecture, no real buildings can be recognized. Some details and elements are used in different compositions, but not an entire building. This was an actual request from director James Gunn. It's pretty much the advice from Inception. Never recreate places from your memory. Always imagine in new places. Well, you gotta draw from stuff you know, right? Only use details, uh, a, a street lamp or a phone booth, never entire areas. Let's dig into this. The two movies take us on seven very different locations. Morag, the abandoned planet at the beginning of the first film. Xandar, the capital planet of the Nova Empire. The Kiln, a high security prison in space. Nowhere, a shady mining colony. The Sovereign, a collective of planets. Contraxia, a frozen world. And Ego's planet. Each has their own traits and it is easy recognizable, regardless of their screen time. Speaking of screen time, only three locations get more of it. Xandar, Nowhere and Ego, so I'll discuss them towards the end. First one we see is Morag, a planet with an unfriendly environment that was once inhabited. The ruins, both their physical remains and the virtual reconstruction, look inspired from Egyptian temples, combined with ones from Cambodia and some Indian details. The massive colonnades and the two registers resemble the Luxor temple. The side towers look like Angkor Wat, but a little tweaked, and the interior details are inspired by old Hindu temples. The enormous element above them almost feels drawn at a different scale, and considering the contemporary design of its shape, I believe it was intended as a later addition, an extension of the old temple done in a later period of this civilization. Moving on, we have a prison, the kiln. Like any other facility in space, it is designed as a ship or a space station, sealed off from the vacuum with everything pointing inwards, which also makes sense here for security reasons. I don't have any buildings to talk about being mostly corridors and rooms, but what I can say is that from the outside it looks like an offshore oil rig with docking platforms. In the opening sequence of the second movie, we see the Sovereign, a genetically engineered race of people that live on several clustered planets with the same name. From a distance it reminded me of Coruscant, but on a closer look we see everything is gold, even the people. Also, almost every building has round or spherical elements in their design, from the elevated platform to the neighboring skyscrapers and culminating with the palace. I believe this was inspired by Newton's cenotaph, designed by Etienne Louis Boulet. The cenotaph is just a study and was never built, but the shape's perfection has a hold of our senses, and its use here comes to support the story. A race obsessed with genetic perfection that see themselves as superior and majestic will certainly use this geometric language to their architecture. From gold and spherical perfection we switch to container-like, boxy buildings and colored neon lights in the disreputable establishments on Contraxia. It is rather strange to place a red light district on a frozen environment, but I guess they take their pleasures whenever they can. We don't get to see too much of it, and what we do see is covered in colorful advertising inspired by 1950s neon signs. The buildings are low-tech with a look of dirty metal and everything has a retro feeling to it, almost like a shabby strip mall where the pretty lights are just makeup to cover the rust. 
but the majority of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 story takes place on Ego's planet. While most of the planet is natural landforms and vegetation, there is one building, a palace, so in tune with its environment it seems more grown than constructed, which makes perfect sense considering the origins of Ego. Ask yourself this, what would a celestial being's creation look like? It has to be complex to reflect its superior nature. And at the same time, it must be constructed, wow. so it has to be logical, mathematical and also aesthetically pleasing. So, fractals. This entire world is designed by making heavy use of fractals. It is unique and very strange at the same time. The building combines gothic elements like sharp pointed arches and buttress with Art Nouveau graphical details in a composition resembling an organic cathedral. When asked if he's a god, Igor said, small g. So it's no wonder why his house looks like a cathedral. Instead of stained glass, the building uses bioluminescence to give it that extra eerie feeling. Again, making perfect sense in this context, you don't need fire or electricity. Also, a common geometric element used is the circle. Again, for the same reasons as before, because we associate it with perfection and Ego sees himself as this perfect being, so his designs reflect it. From one celestial to another, but leaving perfection behind, we move to the chaotic environment of nowhere, a mining colony inside the severed head of an ancient celestial being. It's obvious they have been mining it for some time, because the head is mostly hollow now, and people have built a ton inside it. It's a city alright, with different districts that seem centered around the collector's museum, which makes sense since it's Divan who started the mining operations. I found the way they built nowhere particularly interesting, using the existing structure of the skull and adapting to it, similar to the sprawl of Mexico City with one major difference. There is no horizon here. There's a lot of work in its designs, but the action is fast-paced and it's rather dark, so unfortunately we can't really see too much of it. The few buildings we actually get to see clearly look like retro diners covered in exposed pipework, cables, satellite dishes and all sorts of wiring. This tech punk architecture looks made from secondhand materials, covered in dirt and is pretty much what you'd expect from an illegal mining colony. No big surprises here. Being built inside a giant head, I thought there might be more bridges or cableways crisscrossing this spheroid, but they resumed to just mold the shape. Looking at it now gave me the feeling of a technological ant colony that's slowly devouring the carcass, covering almost every inch of it till there's nothing left. But switching to a lighter tone, I left the best for last. Zandar, the capital city slash planet of the Nova Empire. It's obvious a lot of work went into its design and since it's a bright environment, we get to see it all. Its main source of inspiration was Singapore and the team also borrowed elements from Dubai and Shanghai. Besides its unique stellar shape, the first thing that we see is the abundance of vegetation and my mind immediately associated with Garden by the Bay. Also, a little detail I noticed was the interpretation of Art Science Museum, also from Singapore, aka the Lotus Flower. Another big influence was the Liège train station by Santiago Calatrava, with its white concrete and steel structure. Calatrava has such a personal style that it's hard not to recognize it, so I wouldn't encourage people to use it, pretty much like Frank Gehry. Also the bridge is inspired by Norman Foster's Millennium Bridge, and in a later sequence the metal staircase details from Lloyd's building also in London are visible. Most buildings are white and light grey, there's a lot of glass and some have metallic finishes, and that works very well in this colored environment. In a natural context such as this, if you wish to achieve a refined look, your buildings should not add too much color, but instead play with their shapes, and that's exactly what they did. Some of these designs are questionable in the real world regarding their usefulness, but here we see playful, novel designs that are a perfect fit for the joyful tone of the movie, except two, the Novacore headquarters and the monstrosity that I have no idea what it is. They look like they were designed by someone else for a different setting and just got dropped in this model. Nova Core HQ is a collage of metallic plates. Looks like a modern fortress with no windows, although the scenes inside are bathed in natural light and it seems unfinished. But this didn't bother me as much as the gigantic structure that's in almost every shot. I honestly thought it was meant to be a defensive building or some sort of machinery, but its only purpose in this movie is to get demolished by the villain's ship. 
For a moment I thought they tried an Eiffel Tower effect, but there are at least two such structures, so that's out the window. In any case, it is grossly oversized, doesn't match the delicate and light designs of the rest of the city, serves no real purpose and it looks plain wrong. If it was meant as an industrial platform or as a building under construction, it's unclear. That's my only complaint to this otherwise impeccable city. So, to sum this up, when dealing with many worlds, developing distinctive designs for each setting is key. To make an analogy to our own blue marble, it's like traveling from one continent to another, meeting different cultures and styles. To achieve this, pick references from all over the world and from different time periods. Get inspired by real buildings, but if you want to get that advanced civilization look, check architectural competition entries and look for those building studies that were never made. In a previous video I stated that if you want to make a civilization believable, its cities should hold some history to them. So try mixing styles. That's very difficult and time-consuming when faced with multiple planets and cities. But depending on screen time, this can be really rewarding. Xandar is the prime example of this. Otherwise simplify and choose one unique trait, a dominant feature to convey the backstory of that particular location. Also, when going for that poor and overpopulated feeling, the obvious technique is crowding a lot of elements together to denote the lack of interest in the aesthetic of the built environment. And for an extra retro look, add mechanical controls and less digital. That's my take on part one for Architectural Space Opera and I hope you enjoyed it. I will also encourage you to subscribe and if you want to further support this channel while getting a look behind the scenes, you can become a sponsor on Patreon. Link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. What should we do next? Something good? Something bad? <laughs>